Welcome into another edition of the KSO Show. Mason Voth, Derek Young here with you as we get set for week two of K State football already. The Wildcats hosting the Trojans of Troy. The most generic name ever if you are a team that comes from a town named Troy. My wife from Troy, Kansas. They are the Trojans. Any Troy you run into, they are bound to be the Trojans. And uh, that's what K State gets uh, with these Troy Trojans from Alabama. Hopefully things go better than the last time K-State faced a team from Alabama, but this is a uh, much different circumstance than that last one. And the Wildcats seem ready for this one. As uh, We have learned throughout the week that the K-State players obviously are willing and uh, I guess you know excited and eager to kind of make up for some previous errors against a group of five opponents. Uh, that was a topic of conversation on Tuesday when Chris Kleiman and the players spoke. Chris Kleiman more along the lines of saying, we just got to take care of ourselves. But the players are aware of what happened last year against Tulane. And I'm sure um, you'd have to think about just how many of them are still here. here. Will Howard being one of them. Uh, but a couple of guys still hanging around from losing to Arkansas State to start the 2020 season, uh, a Sunbelt foe. So K-State gets Troy this week, and uh, we'll see what the Wildcats bring to the table uh, just off the top, D.Y., any immediate thoughts on Troy coming in and kind of what uh, some of the storylines for this week might be for the Wildcats? Well, storyline number one is probably Keegan Johnson's status, which is still undetermined at this point. Uh, he, he didn't play last week, was not in uniform, which was a bit of a shock when we saw that at, at a game time. But he's considered game day-to-day, -day, a game time decision, so we'll see what happens there. Number two is probably that group of five bugaboo that's kind of, you know, crippled the Wildcats three times in what is the last five years, uh, with also Navy and Arkansas State being on top of last year's loss to Tulane. But again, like you, I, I kind of think that this is a team equipped to handle that this time around. I, they admitted this week that they probably took Tulane a little too lightly after being a little bit too full of themselves after a 2 0 start and manhandling. Missouri the week before and of course maybe peeking ahead and and looking at anyone else on the schedule at that moment so I think they're kind of more locked in this time and and I just don't see Troy tripping them up I also don't see Troy nearly being as good as that Tulane game last year so I think that's also part of it uh, they're pretty weak up front when it comes to their offensive line they scored 48 points against Stephen F Austin a lot of that I mean, kind of was smoke and mirrors you had a defensive touchdown a couple short fields. Troy also turned the ball over four times themselves. Kind of a, a weird, <laughs> excuse me, a weird and ugly game. But I, I, you know, I think Kansas State, you know, spoiler alert, I think they're going to take care of business. Yeah, I mean, I, I do think K-State probably uh, in a better mindset and you get a Troy team that, like you said, number one, I don't see any way they're as good as the Tulane team from last year uh, for, you know, many different reasons. Gunnar Watson is not Michael Pratt. And also, even though Kamani Vidal is a very good running back, I don't pay attention to what he did last week, but he's not as good as Ty J. Spears was for Tulane. And I, I think that we probably uh, can assume that they, they don't have a coach as good as Willie Fritz on their sidelines. So I, I do expect them to come out focused and, like Chris Kleiman said, take care of themselves. And they'll probably be able to handle Troy, who, I mean, the 48 to 30 last week, the way that I look at this, Troy's biggest weakness is probably their defense. When they get into conference play, they're going to rely heavily on probably having one of the better offenses in the Sun Belt. Doesn't mean that it's a great offense by any means, at least pairing up against K-State. But it does seem to me that, hey, if Troy is going to lean on their offense, I would rather have Troy's offense against K-State's defense and then K-State's offense against Troy's defense. And K-State should win that battle more times than not. And so that's what I'm expecting uh, out of the game this week. And we'll see ultimately how things end up playing out. K-State was really good up front last week. So having those nose guards and, and defensive ends play well a week ago, that's big for what's probably coming up against trying to stop the run that Troy is probably going to establish in this game. And this will probably be one of those where, you know, we see different guys get tested that didn't necessarily have to have it last week. Obviously, the linebacker situation is going to probably be a little bit different because you lose a rotation guy like Jake Clifton, who's so important because you know, Chris Kleiman said it on Tuesday. like He's special because he can play all three spots at linebacker for us. Now K-State's going to have to kind of re retool things there. And Gunnar Watson, 
older, more experienced, has played in bigger games before, he's probably going to have a better willingness to take some shots down the field, which doesn't necessarily mean that's a good thing for Troy, but it does mean that we're going to get to see the K-State corners probably get tested uh, a little bit more this week. So we'll start with kind of breaking down the games and, and looking at this more from a K-State angle here. And we'll start offensively. It's the talk of the town, 45 points put up uh, a week ago in the opener. Now Will Howard gets to come back out with this really good offensive base, it looks like. Obviously, Colin Klein is in a good spot as offensive coordinator, and we already saw some of the you know year two ramping things up, even to, to a new level compared to last season. We know what the running backs look like. I think both DJ Gins and Treshawn Ward lived up to the billing last week. I would expect similar things out of them this week. And the receivers, I mean, you were without Keegan Johnson, who we might see and get back, but um, you were able to go out and kind of see those guys uh, showcase. Jaden Jackson caught the first touchdown of the game. R.J. Garcia was really good. So you feel like K-State has got a pretty good established offense ready to uh, take on Troy here. And uh, I'll, I'll ask you first before I jump in with what I think works against Troy, but what's, what's the thing offensively that stands out to you where K-State can kind of make some hay? Yeah, it'll be interesting because it looks like Troy's defense could be a weakness, right? They gave up 30 points to Stephen F. Austin. I would venture to say maybe that's not necessarily accurate. They rode their defense all of last year, and a lot of those guys are back, especially on the defensive line. They just have one of their better guys suspended, so that hurts. But they only gave up four yards of play last week against Stephen F. Austin. So uh, their offense kind of – uh, put the defense in really bad situations by turning the ball over four times. Uh, one of the Stephen F. Austin scores was a pick six, so um, a defensive score. So I think Troy's defense is probably a little bit better than what it showed last week or what it looks like uh, from the naked eye when you see the 48-30 on the scoreboard. And I think their offense is probably a little worse because they got a lot of help uh, from their own defense when you talk about you know a touchdown and two short fields as well. So I, I think – that 48-30 is very deceiving is what I would say. And just for Kansas State, if I'm going to say offensively what works, you know, I really – the pass rush from Troy's defense is probably what they're best at. Um, so does it hurt the Kansas State passing game at all for a team that, you know, or an offensive line at least that let some untouched blitzers come through the, the line of scrimmage in the opener against SEMO? <laughs> Excuse me. Ugh. But um, it, it, if they can clean that up, then I like what they can do from a passing standpoint. But, um, you know, this might be a game where they just want to lean on DJ Giddens and Treshawn Ward in the ground game and just kind of get out of there as quick as possible and on to Missouri. Yeah, I mean, I, that I kind of lean towards thinking that we get a pretty substantial Treshawn Ward game here, mainly just because – well, I think DJ Giddens gets his fair share and, and heavy dosage of carries and everything else that he needs this week um, and probably puts up great numbers again. But because of what you talked about, Troy, you know, they, they lost like half of their leading tacklers from a season ago, like most of them, but they do return, um, you know, guys in some good spots, like in their pass rush. And so if you know that's going to be something they bring at you, especially if Keegan Johnson's not there, you may be a little bit more weary of going to it, especially since, like, you knew last week against SEMO, you could establish and pretty much do whatever you wanted on offense. So if you went out on a drive and you said, we're going to focus on throwing the football here, K-State pretty much could dictate that they wanted to do that. And then if they wanted to run it, they could do that. Troy will give a little bit more pushback and resistance and, and kind of make you work a little bit harder to do what you want to do. And so if the Wildcats get out there and, hey, you know, throwing around is not going to work, Let's give the ball off to some guys. And, you know, there there were some some issues on the offensive line last week. I think maybe more uh, in terms of, you know, their, their pass blocking at times. Although we did see kind of a giant lull early in the first quarter to late in the second quarter where K-State could not do anything running the football. And I think when that's the case and, and you're having to get, you know, the linemen to, to help create holes in the middle, Treshawn Ward's probably more of your guy because he can break out a little bit easier and, and hit the home run. And that's kind of what I expect in this game. So I think the running backs, but more importantly and, you know, refined inside of that that comment by me, I think Treshawn Ward is the guy that probably comes out and has a really good game, uh, even though we very well could see both him and DJ Giddens over 70, 80 yards equally this week. Like, I, I think we're going to have a lot of games this year where we see K-State 
uh, in the the rushing column have DJ Giddens and Trayshawn Ward. Very similar totals. Uh, they may get there in different ways, and they may do different things inside of how they get to them, but the final tally is going to look pretty similar for those guys. So I feel good about K-State running the football against Troy. And, you know, last week with the offensive linemen maybe being questioned a little bit, um, they'll, they'll probably have a little something to prove themselves, and that certainly doesn't hurt in the running game to have guys wanting to push a lot harder for you. Yeah, I could see that. I could see them wanting to establish that phase of the game and kind of, you know, redeem maybe a little bit of what happened last week. Or it could be Connor Riley and Colin Klein saying, let's rely on them and force them to get where they need to get before that Missouri game gets here. Yeah, although, I, you know, I, this would just be like a guess because we've seen this at different times. It's more fun to throw the ball around. Will Howard, out ne- next to Cooper Beebe, is your best offensive player, but he's your best offensive skill position player. Uh, that's the kind of thing where you open up a game against an inferior opponent. You might be looking to make some big plays early, and so probably do a couple things and set up a, a big bomb. So I, I wouldn't be shocked if, with all this running that is is probably going to come this weekend, if the first drive of the game is like, we're going to let Will set the tone here, especially if Keegan Johnson is out there to start the game where you might just, you know, test the deep one early between those guys, see uh, where the connection's at and how it applies to to game speed. Did it last week with Jaden Jackson. Yeah. Yeah, and the, the hope is that Keegan Johnson is better than Jaden Jackson. So we'll have to see uh, what goes on there. From, uh, you know, the, the positives to the negatives here, what concerns you offensively for K-State this week, if any? I mean, you already kind of mentioned, hey, Troy's pass rush is probably the best part about their defense. Um, so I assume that's probably part of what you're going to say. But uh, is there anything else that you, you're concerned about? Maybe it doesn't even have to do with Troy, but it could just be with something that K-State needs to get better and improve upon themselves. Uh, the offensive line, I just I would like to see them have a sharper, cleaner game and, and obviously keep Will Howard upright against the Troy pass rush. Yeah, I, I right at this point in the season, I'd like to add more and act like uh, there there were two smart guys in this room. There's only one right now. You've got the right answer there because w- as of now, everything else is going really, really well for this offense. Now, we've only seen 60 minutes of football, so that could all very easily change uh, this weekend, and we'll see if the, the group of five curse rears its ugly head. Defensively speaking for K-State, uh, we saw last week Some really good things. The nose guards were probably the most overwhelming positive in my eyes because there were some question marks with Uso Samalo's health and then also just how Javon Banks and Damian Elalio would kind of fill in behind him. We got our answer. I think all three of those guys looked pretty good while they were out there. It's a step up in competition level this week, and we'll get to probably see other elements of the defense tested. Uh, But what are you banking on K-State doing well defensively against Troy? dominating the line of scrimmage once again. I mean, yeah, I think Troy is a better team than SEMO. I'm not convinced that they have a better offensive line than SEMO. That's that's a weakness for the Trojans. They Their sack rates last year were pretty pedestrian. It wasn't great last week either. Kansas State really can get after the quarterback. Um, you know, Gunnar Watson, solid dude, that maybe he's going to push the ball a little bit more but he's also not someone that can really evade a rush Mm -hmm. all that well either. So, you know, Kansas State had a lot of tackles for loss last week, got after the quarterback, controlled the line of scrimmage. I expect more of the same. I could see double-digit tackles for loss again. Um, This is a a defensive line that I would anticipate feasting on the Troy offensive line. Um, I mean, I it's it's good that you point out the tackles for loss because, yeah, Stephen F. Austin got six of them last week against Troy. Um, and, and that's in a game that Stephen F. Austin got dominated and, you know, all these different things that play into it. Um, it not this, that this has anything to do with anything, but I was explaining uh, my distaste for a certain uh, local radio crew uh, a couple of weeks ago. And it's because instead of using the term, like the full term tackles for loss, they repeatedly would use TFL, TFL. And, it's another TFL. And they did it in a game where uh, I think the final score ended up being like 56-3. to three. This was my freshman year at K-State. Uh, it was a KU-Oklahoma game, so you all can probably figure out who I'm talking about. But okay. KU, I was going to say, that's a pretty good Im- imitation. <laughs> you sounded just like him. 
Uh, I tried not to sound too much like him there. I didn't want to, you know, get my myself into trouble here. Um, maybe at the maybe at the end or uh, whenever we're t- we're talking about that game a little bit. But it, KU got dominated in that game, and they came away with like eight tackles for loss. And so, as much as I hated on, like, okay, we don't need to say TFL. It's another TFL. Like, uh, we can throw in tackles for loss every once in a while. Really nitpicky thing by me. But KU had a lot of them in that game, and I think it's very telling when you get you know, an inferior opponent and they're still able to put up a number like that. And then obviously we saw K-State take advantage of SEMO in that category. And K-State is going to put basically 11 guys on the field every single time that have the capability to come up and make a play like that. Like we've seen Kobe Savage come from the very far, you know, back part of the defense to make a play like that. And so uh, I would side with you. I mean, I think we see the TFL number very high. Uh, for for the Wildcats this weekend. And I, I also would go out to say that even though Jake Clifton is uh, likely not going to be a part of the, the lineup on Saturday, I do think that, you know, the linebackers are probably a pretty key strength for K-State right now. And they have a lot of different dudes that they can kind of still rotate in there that are going to be looking to make plays and can do it. And honestly, like, if you just have an Austin Moore on your team against somebody like Troy – I feel pretty good about your playmaking abilities. And, you know, Daniel Green was really good in the game against Tulane last year. Like, he was able to do a lot in the middle of the field helping the K-State defense to confuse Michael Pratt and to help, you know, kind of contain Tajay Spears as well as they did. So outside of just everybody getting in there and hounding Troy behind the, the line of scrimmage, I think the linebackers probably have a really good game this week. Interestingly enough, I think the three backup linebackers this week, because if you told me last week who, who or asked me last week who it would be, I would say uh, Jay Clifton. And they're like, what about the other two? Mm-hmm. Like, Jay Clifton and Jay yeah. Clifton. This week, I think it might be three freshmen. Now, one's a redshirt freshman, but also two true freshmen. I think it's going to be Asa Newsom at the will spot behind Austin Moore. I would imagine it being Austin Remain at the mic behind Daniel Green. And redshirt freshman Toby Osinsami at the Sam behind Desmond Purnell. Three three guys that I am very excited to see get more playing time. Obviously, everybody is pumped about Ace and Newsom um, because you know that that was a big win for K State in, in recruiting when they got him. And but Austin Romain last week, I'm, like I told you earlier this week, and watching that game, he just seemed to be right there, like. Obviously, I'm not going to you know compare him in any way to to Austin Moore at this point, but like there that it had that characteristic where you just looked up and all of a sudden you're like, what the heck's 45 doing on that play? Where, where's he? How'd he get in there? And then I mean, as a as a full blown Wichita at this point for you know three years now, uh, I've got it. I'm excited to see Toby Austin Sami. Now also he's like a freak of athlete, freak of nature athlete, so I'm excited about that too. Uh, but those three guys are really exciting, and I think that the, their abilities also play into uh, kind of creating havoc for for this Troy offense that has some things that can make them potent, but they're in all likelihood not going to be able to uh, keep up with K-State. It was funny to watch Toby last week. I mean, he was literally a blur. Like, I don't know that he had his eyes up at times because it just looked like he was going in a straight line as, as fast as he could every play, um, regardless of what happened or was transpiring at the time where he maybe should have adjusted the straight line. Nope. I'm just going to blow up that guy. He was like, it was more like a water boy. It was like, I, that's my dude right there. And just like bull, like a bowling ball right through him. Easton Newsom played fast. He did well. I thought. And like you said, Austin remain. Uh, yeah. I, I, you can make an argument that he might've been the best true freshman um, last Saturday, in, in my opinion. So uh, a lot to like. Yep, lot lot to like. Now, for things that we may not like, are we just in agreement that it's it's week two of repeating what we kind of said last week about seeing the mainly the corners tested a little bit more, and that would be the the only concern for the defense this week is that we just we still don't know what those guys are going to look like in coverage when they're seriously tested downfield. Yeah, that's probably fair. Uh, I, I would I would agree with that. Tino can really sling it around. Troy's not really that. Um, yeah, not necessarily convinced that Troy can be that team either. Yeah. So we'll see. Yeah, I, I just think it's pretty simple at this point. I mean, it's early in the season, so it's tough to have like these major concerns or whatever. But that's the one where we just know, hey, we didn't get to see everything that we would have liked to have seen last week. And kind of the hope with Troy, I think we said it earlier in the week, that you 
get a team like Troy and they're the perfect group of five opponent where they're going to probably give a little bit more resistance than what SEMO did last week. And they're going to be able to test you a little bit more in a lot of different areas. And you should still be able to take care of business as long as you just, like Chris Kleiman said, worry about yourself. It's less about worrying what Troy can do, more about worrying what you can do. But you may get a little bit of that that test in there. And, and that's probably the, the hope and the benefit with bringing a team uh, like Troy into the fray. So we'll see yeah. how it ultimately ends up working out for him. But I, I'm just going to you know repeat myself and say, hey, it's the corners. See how they are in coverage. Because I was encouraged by how they tackled last week. I got Jacob Parrish. Uh, and Keenan Garber were great when they were in like open field tackling situations. Now we just got to see how they, they work when the ball's in the air. And J- Jack Fabris had a, uh, a, uh, an opportunity as well and, and cashed in on it too. And something that I would add would be to be able to increase the snap load or the workload for Uso Sayamala going into mm-hmm. the Missouri game. I think that's probably should be pretty paramount and critical for this week. Yeah, I mean, we talked – we talked about it enough to this point where I, I have it in, locked in my head. 11 snaps last week for Uso, but he made the most of them, and uh, we'll see how it kind of goes for, for him this week. It would seem like he probably you probably – I mean, I'll let you pick it. What would your number of – like ideal number of snaps for Uso be this week for K-State to where you're still not pushing him, but he gets a little bit more, and uh, he, he kind of gets himself a little bit better conditioned probably to play a, a full game's reps against Missouri? get them to 20 to 25 probably is what I would be thinking. And then you can kind of maybe get to 30, 35 for the Mizzou game. Sounds like a, like a good number to me. All right, let's move on now. We will dive into uh, maybe everybody's favorite part of the week because it's uh, getting close to the weekend. You've probably gotten paid recently and you're looking for a way to make more money. So let's dive into uh, the best bets for the week. Uh, last week, very K-State heavy with them. This week, uh, we'll, we'll keep it pretty K-State heavy, but we'll have some other good ones out there for you because uh, I tell you what, Derek Young does not just know Cats football. He just knows football in general. So that is something to uh, keep an eye on and, and take a peek at. Well, first off, uh, the the general knowledge on this game for uh, you know betting purposes, K-State started the week like minus 15. Now it's minus 16 and a half. Some places it's up to minus 17. Uh, you like the cats to cover, I assume this week, right? Yeah, I got it at 15. Uh, I might be a little bit more shy to take it at 17 though. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, that's, I mean, that's a good like FCS game number, uh, as you can, you know, probably figure and see, I'm going to, to kind of assume that K-State can do it no matter what the number is this week. I just, you know, I think they're in a good spot and they can, they can handle all of this. Okay. We, uh, we now have uh, our, our man, Drew Galloway, who last week we decided may have kind of juiced the, the numbers a little bit, made a couple of them pretty easy things to pick out. Um, but I'll, I'll go back to one that we had last week in over-unders, and that would be Ben Sennett, over five and a half catches. Does he do it this week, or does he sit right at five again? I, I'm going to under. Just like I – it's like gun to my head. I would say Keegan doesn't play, but Keegan didn't play last week either. And he got five all in the first half. I could see the game script being similar to the one last week and uh, spread the ball around a little bit. But like we said that they might really want to run the ball this week. Yeah. I, will, it'll, I would say under five seems like a pretty good number for him to kind of peek at. Um, Cause he, he was getting a heavy dosage last week be tough to, to kind of get there. Okay, here are some of the ones that uh, that Drew has set for this week for the game with Troy for the Wildcats. And this is probably the most in- entertaining one for people to kind of think about. This in no way will impact your your checkbook because I, I doubt that uh, any of the sports books are this dialed into K-State football to, to bring this one up. But over under 23 and a half snaps for Keegan Johnson. And I think you've maybe probably given away your answer already and in, in how you see this playing out. 23 and a half. He probably, like, I, I would have set the number at 10 and a half if yeah. he thought there was a chance that he played. Because if he does, he's going to be limited, I would assume, on, on a pitch count, just like the Chris Tennant pitch count during practice to, now to uh, get him ready. So, uh, yeah, overwhelming under. And if you gave me this one on the books, I may, I may put KSO's 
uh, <laughs> higher value on it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would have said it like, kind of, I assume, I would have said it at probably 11 and a half because like the Uso number last week, like I said, it's just sticks out in my head. So it's one of those that I go, okay, you know, that probably wouldn't be bad. Like he gets out there, he runs a few more routes and maybe since he's a receiver, you give him a few more. Uh, but yeah, that, that, that probably would be, uh, and under. Okay, this is another one that's very K-State specific and not going to impact the checkbooks in any way, but is really good for the storyline and kind of what we know about K-State football right now. And it's over under four and a half true freshmen see the field again. Uh, they record a snap in the game. And I would I would say this offense slash defense snap. We don't count special teams either way. I think the answer probably the same for both of us. I think we, we, we're both probably going to go over would be my guess, but maybe you're a little different than that. Well, it's, it's good three. I think Jack Fabris is a mm-hmm. guy who plays. The three linebackers you mentioned? Yeah. Well, Jack Fabris, two linebackers, right? Romaine yeah. and uh, Asa Newsom. Yep. So they get you to three. Need two more. I don't know. I mean, are you thinking Avery gets a snap again this week? That would probably be where you look for it. It's a, uh, to, my, my game script has that as a borderline um, in terms of what my final score is. Does he get a snap? Does You know, he probably does, even the games. in. I would lean yes on Avery Johnson. Uh, I'm not sure about those freshman receivers because they didn't seem to get in until yeah. after the fact, even though they played really well. That's Trey Spivey. Jace Brown, same thing with Joe Jackson. He got in kind of after the fact. Maybe Cheedy, if you want to rotate the defensive line a little bit. And he played well. I will go over, but I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. Okay. I would guess – I'll I'll say this. I think Trey Spivey comes across as a guy that like six and a half minutes left in the second quarter – We'll be up there and you'll like kind of wipe your eyes and be like, oh, is that Trey Spivey out there right now? And then we may not see him the rest of the game. Like he gets he gets one rep out there and then we don't see him again. Like I just think he makes a catch like that last week. Uh, you're you're rotating through a bunch of different receivers. And at, like at one point last week, the three receivers on the field, it was Jaden Jackson, Phillip Brooks, and Seth Porter at one point. Um, no offense to like Seth Porter and Phillip Brooks, but I want guys that have bigger potential to like pop for something really big on the field at receiver. Um, and so, you know, maybe you, you give one of the younger guys a chance. And I, to me, I, I've been on it from the beginning. I think Trace Spivey is the guy that, that probably profiles best for that. So uh, you, you, you did give me a little bit more pause on it. Made me think a little bit harder about it, but I, I'm, I'm still going with my, my overpick. I, it may be tough to kind of, pick the formula of how to get there, but I do think that we probably still get there this week for K-State. It'll be close. Okay. Uh, Here's a good one. Daniel Green, over under six and a half tackles this week. Um, Daniel Green was, you know, he was he made some plays last week. He's trying to to get himself back to to better health. I took the under on this one. Um, Even in, like, some good games from Daniel Green, he doesn't get to seven tackles. And I think that there's a way for Daniel Green to impact the game this week, but it may not necessarily be in terms of him making plays and, and getting a guy down on the ground. You know, with the backets being true freshmen, Daniel Green really doing well against a group of five opponent last year and kind of got his feet wet after being injured throughout some of camp. Uh, I guess feet wet last week. I will go I oh oh I will <laughs> I will go over. Over. Okay. Um, yeah. I think that's one of those that the six and a half is, I, I've, I, you know, I've already given Drew plenty of shit about the, you know, where he's setting some of the numbers. Six and a half is probably the, the right number right there. Cause I could very easily see Daniel Green sitting on six or seven uh, by the time the game ends on Saturday. Uh, moving forward, K State sacks. Two and a half is the number that Drew set. Over. Over. Uh, yeah. I took the over. over. We already talked about it. We think that uh, K State's going to be in the backfield quite a bit on Saturday. They were really good in that area uh, against SEMO. And I think that we have seen now, I mean, they had guys from each of the different positions up front, you know, and what traditionally would have been called like the front seven. It's a little different now with how, uh, you know, new age defenses work, but we saw the defensive ends get a sack. We saw the nose guards get a sack. We saw the linebackers get in there. 
Um, I, I think that this is a pretty easy over on this one. And I, this is one of those games where K-State could have a very impressive sack number, uh, if you ask me. Yeah, I, I, I even said on PowerCat game day that you can listen to on Saturday before the game. I think it would be at 7 a.m. to 9 a.m. this week. Uh, could be a very sack-heavy game for Kansas State. Like, if you told me Kansas State's going to have seven sacks on Saturday, I'd be like, could see it. Yep. Yep. Well, I think uh, I think that's that's probably right. Okay. Here's a. This is a good one too because it, it had some conversation last week. K State interceptions one and a half uh, over under for the defense to grab one and a half interceptions. I took the under. I just because we didn't really see the secondary tested a ton last week. I don't know what the the ball hawk prowess is going to be looking like for these guys. I think they probably get one, but I'm not sure that they end up coming away with two this week. Uh, it just seems like a, a, a big ask for a group that wasn't able to do it against the, an FCS opponent last week. Yeah, I'll take the over just because if you're going to have a sack heavy game and cause that much havoc and disruption in the backfield, you're probably making everything else pretty complicated for Troy. And I guess a guy like named Gunner Watson – Probably going to take more chances when there's pressure as opposed to Paxton De Laurent last week, uh, who I think just decided to hang on to the ball or he, you know, flip it two yards uh, past the line of scrimmage and, and settle for having third and 17 coming up and, and deal with that. Um, the other one that, that Drew has out there for us, and again, you can read our full explanations for these uh, when they get published, and uh, they'll be right there for you with the over unders on K State online. But Treshawn Ward. 76 and a half scrimmage yards uh, for the game on Saturday. I know your answer. You kind of tipped mm -hmm. your hand yep. early. Yes. Uh, I'm, I'm I, an over I, guy for this one. I, uh, uh, this, this is a good number. Um, I'll say over, but uh, I don't feel a lot of conviction either way. So I'll let you roll with this. Okay. All right. Well, yeah, I'm just, I, I go over because I, like I said, I think it's probably set up to be a big game for him. Um, the K-State offensive line maybe had some struggles and maybe Troy is going to get a little bit of push up there. He's just, he fits the bill as the guy that's going to be easier to getting to bounce outside or, or break off some big runs. And he kind of is the guy that when there was a lull running the ball last week, had some big runs for K-State to kind of break off. Um, he strikes me as the kind of guy that, you know, you're, you're in a situation where you're trying to figure out what to do and you think, well, let's just hand it off and see if something pops. He's the guy that's going to get that carry, and he's the guy that could make something really big happen. So uh, I am I'm all in on Trayshawn Ward, not just for this game, really for the entire season. Um, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to John Kurtz this at all. But like, if I had my guys, Trayshawn Ward would be a my guy, mainly because I remember sitting in the hotel in New Orleans last year with you watching him tear apart Oklahoma in their bowl game. So I am a Trayshawn Ward guy through and through. A good pick. I guess if I had him, my guy, right now, I think I've. Have I claimed Chris Tennant? I feel. I feel like uh, my, my guy's. Well, I picture. actually think uh, the adoption papers are ready for you right now because yeah. yes, you are all in on Chris Tennant. Chris Tennant and what Keegan Johnson, and he can't get on the field yet. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, those are your two guys so far. Uh, at least in the you know, it's just, Austin just Moore's no been my guy for forever though. So. Yeah, well, the, you've got good taste in, in in guys because I tell you what that uh Austin Moore I did not that was one of those I had a C to believe last year and I had a C a lot before I was like okay them calling him the machine and all this stuff like I I will give him that now like he is legit and he's been impressive ever since like you you can't say a bad thing about Austin Moore and the way he plays like he is so dang important to uh this team and, and this defense for K State and his his younger brother is now playing football at Lewisburg High School in Kansas. We saw him on a sideline as a visitor last week, and I kid you not, Drew couldn't tell if it was Austin or his brother. They looked identical. Yeah, there uh, might be some, like, just some some checks by anybody that, that that sees him on the high school field this year. Like, are we sure that's not a potential all-Big 12 <laughs> linebacker out there? Because they – I mean, they look identical. And, and that's just somebody that has uh, a younger brother that looks just like them. Yeah, they, they, they fit the bill there. All right, moving on uh, in the in the in this part of best bets, we've talked about like some in-game stuff for K-State. Anything else that, that will actually be on the board for people to maybe take a look at that you like that involves K-State this weekend? Oh, of course, of course. Um, as I said, I think 
Detroit offense is a little bit of fool's gold. I think Kansas State's going to destroy, from a defensive standpoint, destroy the line of scrimmage. Troy's team total is at 16 and a half, and it's actually juiced to the over. I would I would really be tempted to take the under. I might myself. I keep looking at it. So the under 16 and a half Troy points is kind of sticking out to me. Also, depending on how you think this game goes, like for me, like I've said all season, I think Troy's not all that, and I think Kansas State can kind of cruise. Largest lead of the game, that line is set – to 21 and a half and the the under is actually what's juiced right now and and i mean i can't say winning by more than three touchdowns so yeah I, I mean that's one of those that i was i was trying to think to myself okay what what did i say and project the score to be last week when we were doing the the predictions i had k-state winning 31 17 in this game um, so I guess, you know, Troy, the, the over under on Troy points, that's one of those that should maybe scare me. Um, <laughs> I just, I, I don't know. I, I feel really good about K state going into this weekend and it just feels like they're, they're not going to mess around in any way, shape or form. So I would probably lean towards, uh, what it's, you said it's 21 and a half on largest lead of the game. I'd go over that. And I think K state could probably do that. And it can't, excuse me. I think it's that smoke, uh, from Canada. Yeah. That's in Kansas. Seriously, I think it's giving me a problem today. Um, this was happening when I was doing three mall earlier. Was it three mall power cat game day? It may like, just be that we have you. We, we're making you talk too much right now. I, this is my eleventh show of the week, so this <laughs> I might be running out of gas. But the uh, Kansas State team total is thirty four and a half. That that's more in your lane. Yeah. I would maybe steer clear a little bit from that because I do think Troy's defense is probably better than what they see. Can at least slow K State down a little bit more and make. And I'm telling you, the new clock rules, it it'll make you a little bit scary if you're dealing with anything with like a, an over in terms of points because uh, you you better watch out. Depending on the flow of the game, that the time on the clock evaporates just like that, and all of a sudden you're oh, you're out of time. That and that happened, especially when the other team's running clock, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's so easy to run clock. Because I remember I was like, oh, the games. It was like I think a hair over four minutes left. And I left the press box because I was like, oh, you know, the game's not in doubt. Um, I got all of our stuff written. I just need to hit publish when the, and the clock hits zero. The clock can hit zero right when I get to veneer. By the time I got down from the elevator, the game was over. I was only <laughs> in the elevator for like five minutes. I was like, okay, the, the game time was like real time. It just zipped off. All right. So we'll, uh, we'll, we'll move on now. Branching outside of the, the K-State realm here. Uh, any other games that, that catch your eye or numbers that you've got to, to be thinking about for best bets in college football for week two? Well, we could start, you know, and since we're releasing this Friday morning pregame, tonight, right? Yeah. Mason Voth will be in the house at in the, the booth. booth wearing his orange and blue, and I uh, will be I'll be backing the orange and blue. Okay, so fun story real quick about me wearing the orange and blue uh, for the, the fighting Illini here. Um, I, I obviously did not have an Illinois shirt just floating around. I have a lot of random shirts, but I did not have an you Illinois have shirt. Texas, but not Illinois. <laughs> yeah. So, um, because I, you know, I, I'm, I'm getting my ticket for free this evening. I was like, I need it. I, I, I can't show up there without an Illinois shirt on. Like, I feel like it's my duty. And it's called Brad Underwood. Uh, no, I didn't call Brad. I just figured things were still a little tough there. And so, you know, for, for those that don't know, I spent I spent last year working closely with an Illinois grad. Uh, we, we've become very good friends. He is now covering Iowa State. And so he's driving from Ames on Friday and then going back for the Cyhawk game the next day. But he was like, well, I've got like a shirt that, you know, it like it's this size. It fits kind of small, though. I was like, dude, I'm not fitting into that shirt. So I decided since I was getting my ticket for free that I would <laughs> – I'm, ho I'm, I'm recording this in my basement. I hope my wife doesn't hear this. I'm going to say this a lot softer. Uh, I bought an Illinois shirt online on Thursday, and I paid the $25 to have it like one day shipping <laughs> to me. The problem is I ordered it after 11 a.m. on Wednesday, so it's not getting here on Thursday, and the UPS thing says its delivery time is by 7 p.m. on Friday. I need it to be in my possession no later than 3 o'clock on thursday or on friday or i am or i am not getting that shirt and 
I'm going to have paid like $70 for an Illinois shirt. So uh, we're just, we're hoping that my, my logic behind was, okay, I'm paying basically for my ticket to get in. If I had to pay for a ticket instead, I'm getting a shirt that I have for a lifetime, you know? So we'll see, but yes, KU Illinois uh, tonight on a Friday in the booth ESPN two. not sure it gets any bigger than that for college football. DY. Oh yeah. I think I saw a tweet. There were some people disrespected that KU in Illinois was not basically in the top five of games throughout the entire season. Of course, it'd be a little bit uh, sanctimonious here, but I like Illinois plus three and a half. Now, I think you could still win. Don't get me wrong, but I think this is a tight game start to finish. Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm with you. Uh, I've got Illinois earlier, you know, in the week. I, I think I even had them at three, but three and a half is the number that's been out there. I just think KU's defense was not overly impressive for a lot of the game against Missouri State. There's still some questions about how often Jalen Daniels is actually going to play in the game, even though Pete Thamel said on Thursday that Jalen Daniels is likely to play some. Um, I, I think this is a game where Illinois is going to get some some leeway from that KU defense. Brett Bilma can kind of muck things up a little bit, make it a little bit of a nastier game. It's probably going to stay within a, a field goal for most of it. As much as I'm hopeful that the Illini get the job done, I do think KU probably wins that game because I do think they're the better team, but I do think it, it doesn't stray outside of that field goal margin. So uh, I, I am taking the Illini. And, hey, maybe I'm thinking with my heart instead of my head now considering uh, I'm all the way in and financially invested in Illinois football. <laughs> I feel bad for you. <laughs> Being invested in Illinois football has not been a good thing. Although yeah. it was pretty solid last year, of course. Brett Bielma, former Kansas State coach, Played for Bill Snyder, who owned KU. Maybe, maybe that. Mm -hmm. He also has an Iowa Hawkeye tattoo on his leg. Okay. All right. Well, uh, then I hope I hope that helps his defense and not his offense on on Friday, because that would be bad. He got the uh, he got he had a Tiger Hawk logo. That's what you know, they call the Iowa logo, the Tiger Hawk. Uh, it's on his leg when I think probably recently out of college because he played for Iowa. So mm -hmm. okay. Well. Uh, I, I maybe he should leave it exposed for the game on Friday. It'll be a little steamy. Just go shorts, Brett. I'm sure everybody wants to see that. Uh, other other good bets for for the weekend from you. I'll, I'll throw one out real quick that I I like uh, Colorado minus two and a half. As I'm not a big Dion guy, um, and you know just n whatever. I think that's probably a house of cards that falls at some point. But very impressive what they did in week one. They've obviously got firepower galore. And the opposite of firepower is what it looked like Nebraska had in week one against Minnesota. The game is in Boulder. Um, even though I'm really leery about what last week actually meant for Colorado and Nebraska, it just seems like that's a pretty good number to get. It's over a few, it's under a field goal. So I, I am all in on the Buffaloes minus two and a half this week. Uh, and then after that point, the Dion luck can kind of run out. I don't hate it just because – I don't know if Nebraska can keep up. Like, can they score enough points to like cover a two and a half there? I, I don't know. <laughs> That's a little tough. That's a little tough for me. Um, are you? I know you looked for it last week. Your guy, Dylan Edwards, touchdown prop. <laughs> okay, well, don't say he's my guy. Uh, he's just <laughs> a guy call. that I was going to put a touchdown prop bet on last week, and they did not have it anywhere. And then, of course, he scores a thousand times on Saturday, and now he's like minus one fifty. Um, I bet he scores again, but I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna do that because the, the value in that bet is gone now. When he would have had plus odds last week, and I wouldn't like, know what was happening. Is it like NFL games where there's a two touchdown prop? Uh, yeah. yeah, there probably is, and I bet. I, I bet for him, it's it's not it's not worth my time because <laughs> these people. They they learned very quickly about uh, what the deal was. I'll have to I'll have to do some checking on that I have one. Two, I have two more I like from the group of five. So Texas State just beat Baylor, fade them. UTSA minus eleven, love it. It's I don't think it's eleven anymore though. That's the unfortunate thing. Probably telling you all a little too late, but I love that. And we we mentioned this Missouri Super Bowl is next week when they host. The Kansas State Wildcats. This is their Super Bowl. They play Middle Tennessee on Saturday. The line is 20 and a half. Now, Middle Tennessee just did get railroaded by Alabama. 
Um, but I'm going to take them this week because usually when you peek ahead to your Super Bowl, you're not locked in. Well, and I'm with you on that one. I like that one. And also, Missouri didn't like play overwhelmingly well last week to start their season and didn't really put away their opponent until later in the game. So I would side with you on that one. The other one that I, I will throw out there, um, you've mentioned Texas State and their win over Baylor. Baylor's playing their backup quarterback this week. Utah looked really good against Florida last week and, and like they were ready to not miss a beat. Um, I'm taking Utah. No matter what the number would have been set at, I would have said, okay, these people are pretty smart. They know what they're doing. That's probably about right. I'm taking Utah to cover whatever the number is. It's seven and a half, I think, most recently. When I looked at it, I'm on the Utes just because, number one, I'm on record as being a Dave Aranda as a fraud guy, and I will continue to say that. And now he, for the first time in his career, Blake Shapin played lights out. Outside of like the couple, you know, the, the little the action he got against K State in 2021 that made us think he was going to be awesome. He played awesome. Everyone else sucked for Baylor last week. So I'm taking the Utes minus seven and a half uh, in Waco. I don't hate that. I'm really surprised the number's only seven and a half. You know what I would be tempted to do? And maybe I shouldn't because Baylor just gave up how many points to Texas State? Uh, was it 31? Was it maybe 40? more than that? Could oh, could have been maybe was, maybe the Texas State got in the 40s and Baylor was in the 30s. I can't. Uh, I think that's what it was. Yeah, I think that was. I would be tempted to take the under because both teams are playing their backup quarterback. But Baylor did just give up 100 to Texas State, so I don't know. Yeah, 42-31 Texas State. So there you go. Um, Yeah, that's not a bad thought. I mean, yeah, Florida slowed down Utah enough, but they just couldn't keep up uh, on the the offensive side of the scoreboard. So, all right, those uh, those are the things to note, best bets of the week. Uh, now we'll move in real quick to the Big 12 scoreboard. This is a last year. This was a bit that I would do uh, because I was basically making fun of the fact that conference realignment was making everything crumble. We've got a bunch of these different schools, so I would always refer to Arizona State and Arizona as you know future Big 12 schools or Gonzaga or whatever is the joke. Now it's a reality. Most of those schools that I joked about are Big 12 schools uh, in the Big 12 this week. Is there anything that, that we didn't bring up in best bets that you maybe want to take note of or you're uh, excited to watch? Obviously, Alabama-Texas uh, is the big one and might give us kind of some more insight on if Texas is the real deal or not this year. Yeah, te- that would that game kind of registers with me just because Texas hang, hung with that, a better Alabama team, I think, probably last year. So that'll be interesting. I People hate when I say this stuff, but I would not be surprised if Texas won. I really wouldn't. Um, and then Tech-Oregon. I think the Tech loss to Wyoming was a fluke, but we'll know when they play Oregon, which Lubbock should be on fire Saturday night. That'll be a lot of fun. Glad our game's at 11 a.m. Mm-hmm. We can watch those too. Yeah, this is a good week to have an 11 a.m. kickoff for K-State because there are there are a lot of good night games. A very late night game that I'm interested in watching, it, speaking Oklahoma of Big 12 State. scoreboard, Oklahoma State at Arizona State. I think two teams that probably suck this year based off of what they showed in week one, uh, Oklahoma State, probably going to play three quarterbacks again. I looked at their depth chart this week when uh, I was or, going or, through. Or. and Yeah, or, 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 or sounded like a, like a walrus out there uh, for Mike Gundy and his quarterback depth. And I think Arizona State probably wins the game. I, can't I, don't, do think they're, I don't think they're good, but Jaden Rashada has the most, uh, the most talent at quarterback in that game of the four that are going to see the field, Arizona state at home. We'll, we'll see how hyped everybody is for that. I mean, it, we'll see what the attendance is like, but I think that they probably have enough juice to get it done. Like Kenny Dillingham is a guy that is ascending with his program. Mike Gundy has a program that is kind of getting burnt out on him and, and he's, you know, losing a little bit of touch. So I'm interested in that one, mainly just to see what those two train wrecks look like on the field together, because Another game that is going to be dog crap on your eyes and has two teams that struggle, Iowa-Iowa State is going to be fascinating on Saturday to see how that plays out. And, uh, it, like, that's a game for Iowa State to maybe prove. Like, I don't know that Iowa's great, but Iowa State, that's a game to kind of prove that even with everything that's gone on, maybe they are going to rebound a little bit better from last year and all the offseason gambling stuff than what we thought. Uh, th- those are two good ones to point out in the storylines that revolve around them. How about Cincinnati? They play Pitt on mm-hmm. the road. 
And what's the best part about it, it's on the CW. So yes. if you also want to watch Penn and Teller or Dawson's Creek Penn or Sabrina, Teller, the yes. Rich, the, I, I, look, uh, I think it was Mitch that looked. I think it's like sandwiched in between Penn and Teller and then something else. Like One Tree yeah. Hill, maybe. One Tree Hill. Uh, yeah, well, uh, One Tree Hill, gosh. I tell you what, that is a show that uh, I watched a lot with uh, my wife during COVID because she just, you no, know, that was a show that she watched growing up. And one of those that was on and you just shake your head and go, this is what people actually like. But uh, I did pick up enough on that to know that I am a team team Dan there. Dan's the name of the dad in the show that actually kills his own brother inside of a high school. So kind of a, a fun little story there. Oh, for everybody. <laughs> uh, yeah. Let me see here if I can uh, pull up my CW local listings. I don't think I can get far enough out right now on a uh, YouTube TV, but that's here's seriously though on Cincinnati Emory Jones was awesome last week speaking of a former Sun Devil um Florida and then Arizona State guy he was really good last week one big 12 newcomer and offensive player of the week and that's a game for Cincinnati who I'm also not very high on this year in the big 12 Pitt's not great but if they go on the road and they can win that game that's significant and that means something and shows a little bit more fight and impressive nature to Cincinnati than I thought was there yeah, I think we learned a little bit about Houston last week. We're talking about the four mm-hmm. newcomers because they had the best win of the week and they beat UTSA. Well, this week, I think it's will be about Cincinnati and UCF. UCF plays Boise State. Yeah, you, that's going to be a, a fun one to follow. Oh. I think that's also like a 6 o'clock kick. Yeah, now Boise did get whipped pretty good by Washington. Yeah, uh, and you, I'm glad you bring up Houston. Throw it back to best bets real quick. I think they were like minus 9.5. I would take that against Rice, even though Rice – slowed texas down a little bit texas probably did more of that to themselves than than what rice did um but i i think houston they probably had the best win of the week last week in the big 12 for what they were able to accomplish but that will uh tie a bow on the big 12 and everything else going on this weekend let's bring it back to the game that we're most focused on 11 a.m kick fs1 on saturday the cats and the trojans Give me your game MVPs, one on offense, one on defense, and then a prediction for how things play out between K-State and Troy. Yeah, this is uh, – I don't think it's going to be a close game. I have Kansas State 37-13. to 13. I, I thought this is a game that they've almost circled to an extent just to redeem themselves, shut people up. Troy's not as good as they were last year. Probably were a little overrated last year to begin with. I think it's a comfortable win offensively and really broke down, you know, so I'm kind of going on a whim here of what we see offensively and who kind of stands out, you know, the offensive line will probably be challenged a little bit. Kansas State will want to run the ball. The Trayshawn Ward thing for you makes sense. I I, I like that. Um, I'll let you take Trayshawn Ward. I'm probably going to go against what I said earlier in the show. So this is probably a stupid ramble by me, but Ben Sinnott, because he's probably the biggest mismatch for against a team like like Troy, to be honest. So maybe he doesn't get six catches, so I can be right. But maybe yeah. he still hovers around 100 yards. I think I think that's probably the way to go. I think he is probably a guy that finds himself in a lot of open space again, racks up a ton of yards. Maybe he doesn't get to the six catches, but he's in that spot. Um, who who would you go defensive MVP then? on uh, on this game because I mean there are a lot of options out there we both said we like what K-State could do in applying pressure behind the line of scrimmage yeah I, I'll just take the best pass rusher Khalid Duke I think he can get multiple sacks okay uh, prediction time throw it out there for us what's what do you think the score is how do you think the game kind of plays out 37-13 sticking to that we get a few Chris Tennant field goals that sail through the uprights again because he just keeps Cruising on stays perfect. If you refactor fiction, you know that's how I feel about it. Will Howard, just a, just a ho-hum performance, you know, from the offense. Uh, they get out early, maybe 21 nothing, and then cruise the rest of the way. But I think, again, like as much as we praise the offense throughout the offseason, this is just a matchup that's conducive to the defense. And I think they're, they're kind of stealing the show the first couple of weeks. Okay, I guess I should have asked you, who's your special teams MVP for the week? Any Anybody – <laughs> stick out there for you uh number how oh, actually what is his number 17 17 17 17 yeah 17 give me 17 okay I'm wow 
I'm getting a Chris Tennant NIL jersey, baby. <laughs> Shocker. What Derek going with uh, Chris Tennant again. All in on the, the Chris Tennant train. Look, here, here's the deal for me. Um, obviously, Treshawn Ward is is the guy that I've I've talked up heading into this game. I just think like he's going to have some really massive games for K State this year, and this seems like one of them where he you know could pop for over a hundred yards and plays a pretty big role. Um, he you know was able to run for a touchdown last week. Should have had another one that the rest didn't give to him. It was an awesome score. If you watch on the YouTube, it's a part of the intro right there. He threw for a touchdown. I doubt he throws for a touchdown this week, but I think Treshawn Ward has a big offensive game. Defensively speaking, um, I mean, we've we've kind of hit on a bunch of different guys that we think come up really big for K-State and just how it all ends up playing out. You already took one defensive end in Khalid Duke. I'll just take the other. I'll take Brendan Mott. Brendan Mott has had some big games out there, and uh, – Honestly, it's kind of just a who's who. If you wanted to pick anybody that could get to behind the line of scrimmage and make plays, I'm not going to laugh at you this week if you said that they were going to be uh, the player of the game defensively just because I think there's going to be mayhem going on in the backfield for Troy. You're going to have wildcat after wildcat in the way fighting to try and take somebody down. So uh, I will, I'll go Brendan Mott just to, to be different than D.Y., even though Khalid Duke, probably a pretty good bet. And – I'll stick with it, I guess, um, and say 31-17 is maybe the final score, something in that nature. I don't think K-State scores an overwhelming amount of points. I think this game kind of slows down a little bit more. Um, but I do think that they break that 30 plateau, and they probably get a big lead early. So we're probably looking at a game that it could be like 31-3 to uh, in the fourth quarter, and then K-State is kind of calling off the dogs and Troy gets like a, a garbage time score. So I might amend saying that, that Troy gets a 17. I could see it being more like 31 to 10. Um, so but no I, Avery Johnson touchdown late is what you're telling well, me. Well, see, that's the other thing that now I'm having to start to think in the back of my head. Like that is a guy that's going to find a way to probably score if he gets in there. So, all right, you've talked me into it, D.Y. Uh, my, my official final score prediction, K-State 38, Troy 10. And I hope it comes to fruition just like that. And uh, it makes makes you look like a genius for talking me into that pick. Yeah, you should probably hop on the twenty one and a half over. Uh, that's why. That's why I'm uh, amending how I thought the game would go because I do think it plays out that way. And also, Troy has no business like kicking more at the end of a game because they're going to be getting their butts kicked. So yeah, I'm I'm thirty eight to ten. That's I'm locking in those lyrics. That's my final answer. I'm sticking with this case, Howie. That's how uh, that's how we're rolling here. Sounds good. All right. Any final thoughts before we close out uh, on this edition of the KSO show? Kansas State rules. Okay. All right. There you go. That's the headline Sunday morning. I hope Tim Everson is listening. Print it in the Manhattan Mercury. Um, keep your – watch your headlines in the Merc every once in a while, especially when Manhattan boys soccer is playing uh, a certain school from Topeka. That was – whoo. What a what a special that was uh, for anybody that, that re read the Mercury this week. You probably know what I'm talking about. That'll do it for DY and I. Follow along with everything going on at K State Online. Lots of great coverage coming this week, especially uh, on the recruiting side of things because it's a, a hectic time. I don't think I'm giving too much away by uh, letting everybody know if you're listening to this on Friday morning. Drew Galloway going to be in Iowa tonight to check out Grant Bricks and get the update there as K-State still heavily pursues uh, one of the best offensive linemen in the class of 2024. So you get that combined with all the great team and game coverage that will be coming your way. And uh, also, if you're not doing it already, make sure that you're subscribed to the KSO YouTube channel as well as the podcast platforms that you can get it for. So that will do it for DY and myself. We will be back on Sunday, at least I will be, with Drew and KSU underscore fan to uh, give you the game, the post-game pod. And then D-Wine, I'll be back on Monday with some storylines from the week and takeaways from the game real quickly. And it'll be into Missouri week as the Cats get ready to head on the road to take on the Tigers. But can't jump too far ahead of ourselves because Troy and K-State is the game this week in 11 a.m., the kick time on FS1.